Call the roll, and then as we all know, please wait to be recognized before you, uh, if you want to speak, so that we can make sure that it gets into the uh, recording. Ms. Avala for Reyes here. Mr. Schaefer for Mr. Chung here. Ms. Gallagher. Mr. Gunn. Sorry, Ms. Gunn for. Did you mention we get married? <laughs> Mr. Gunny. Mr. Gunny. Here. Mr. Hunter. Here. Ms. Johnson Hall. Here. Mr. Metcalf. Mr. Prince. Ms. Ohebu. Here. Ms. Sotello? Here. Mr. Russell? Present. Ms. Boatman Patterson? Here. Ms. Ortega for Mr. Cohen? Here. And Ms. Falk? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. I'd like to now turn it over to Ms. Boatman Patterson for any Second director remarks. Okay, I have uh, three things that I wanted to update you on. Uh, one, I want to uh, congratulate all of our confirmed board members. We had three board members that went through confirmation: Janet, who, and M Michael, and Eileen, who all went through their Senate confirmation, and so they're they've been confirmed. So I want to offer them their congratulations. Um, Two, uh, as by way of legislation, there were two significant pieces of legislation that went through as part of the budget and budget trailer bill that affect uh, California Housing Finance Agency. One was dealing with a, a obsolete um, exempt staff appointment, which dealt with the mortgage insurance fund. We had a director of mortgage insurance. As the agency's needs have changed and when we went through our organizational assessment, that mortgage insurance fund is insolvent, and we are coming up with a plan to wind that down and pay off claims first in, first get paid. And so that position was no longer needed in the agency, and so as part of the budget, we looked at our needs, and what we really needed was a director of enterprise risk and compliance, and so that uh, legislation passed, and so we do have that new change to swap out those positions which more are in line with what the agency's needs are. In addition to that, we have um, a large pot of recycled subordinate debt funds, down payment assistance money, that came in over the last 40 years from a variety of different pots. I think it was eight different sets of programs with eight different program rules of how we would look at that subordinate debt financing and how we could marry that with other programs. And it made it very inflexible because they, we had this money, but we couldn't utilize it and lump it together and utilize it well. And so we had some statutory changes related to that down payment assistance would allow us to have much more flexibility to take that bucket of recycled funds and structure it so that we could work with either nonprofit developers on the home on the home ownership side, either on the self-help side, or work in tandem with local government, which may have a home ownership program, or, or our sister agency, HCD, who has certain programs so that we can align our resources and use them more efficiently and effectively. So those are two legislative updates that we had through the budget process that are very important to us in our programs that actually passed and have been signed by the governor. Um, the No Place Like Home initiative, 
piece one has been signed, and I was going to defer to Ben because HCD is taking the lead on the No Place Like Home initiative. I don't know if you're all aware, but that is the securitization of the Mental Health Service Act funds to create a bond, and he's right on time. And I was just giving them an update, and I was like, I want to defer to HCD on this. And so Mr. Metcalf can give you a little uh, a brief update on the um, No Place Like Home initiative. Step one. <laughs> just in time. Good just morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all? Um, what can I say? So uh, the good news is that we did get the first of two bills that will be needed to authorize the No Place Like Home. Uh, with a two-thirds vote and signed by the governor by the end of June, um, uh, reflecting very strong bipartisan support uh, for the concept of trying to target MHSA dollars to serve mentally ill, chronically homeless uh, individuals or those who are at risk of chronic homelessness. I think it's a fantastic affirmation of the work that Cali Chiffre has done over the last several years with its special needs housing program. Uh, and I think that it uh, pushes quite a bit of money uh, out to the counties uh, to do a whole heck of a lot more of that funding. Specifically, it provides for uh, two pots of money, uh, an initial $200 million slug that's intended to go uh, directly out through the college, existing Cali Chiffe channels. Um, just as soon as we go through a test validation in the state courts, which would have to happen once the second piece of legislation gets passed with the bond enabling language in August. Um, and then a second slug of money, which would be $1.8 billion, uh, that would uh, go out in the manner to be determined through the, upon the creation of guidelines, uh, which these people coordinate. Um, uh, that will be intended to be uh, allocated to counties in a competitive manner. And the legislation provides for a competitive process for the counties to access those funds. Uh, the funds are actually divided into four buckets that counties can apply for depending on their relative, relative size of their homeless population as compared to the balance of the state. There's an LA category, uh, there's a large county category, a medium county category, and a small county category. Um, and each of those pots will be filled based on the, the relative share of homeless that live in that cluster of counties as sort of divided up based on the number of years, or number of rounds, competitive rounds that are anticipated. Uh, counties that would then be expected to, in partnership with developers, uh, apply project by project by project uh, and demonstrate their ability uh, to be better for those funds based on factors like readiness, depth of services, uh, innovation, other other factors that will be established through a guideline setting criteria. In addition, the bill also provides for the four largest counties in California to have a little bit more uh, leeway. Um, it actually the bill provides that LA, San Diego, Santa Clara, San Francisco uh, can actually choose at their election uh, to uh, simply take their pro rata share of the two billion dollars based on their share of homeless and uh, run their own competitive process, uh, do their own uh, monitoring and long-term oversight of those funds and put funds out kind of at their own pace as they see fit. Uh, that authority also will need to get codified and explicated a little bit in guidelines. Um, and the bill uh, also provides at least for a small sliver of technical assistance, I think it's $10 million, something like that, uh, which will be provided to counties to help them sort of build up staff their own infrastructure, build up their own capacity to do this work. Uh, counties will get a kind of an initial uh, piece of money, um, and then um, HCD also will uh, have an ability to kind of put out a global kind of state of California TA contract that um, counties can either use, if they don't use their own allocation of TA, um, kind of on an on call basis, uh, or, uh, can supplement the funds of the counties. Getting counting they have as they do. Um, I will say, for the benefit of the board, this is a big tonk and chunk of money, and I think it's going to be challenging to get it out quickly. Um, I think, I, and I am concerned, I talked with Tia and others just to say one of the challenges here is going to be that most of the projects that we expect to come in to use these funds are going to want to do integrated housing. They're not going to want to do 100% housing for chronically homeless individuals. 
And while these funds will be very helpful for the gap on the share of units that are supporting chronically homeless, I think there are a lot of counties that will be ready to go. Uh, I think one of the bottlenecks that I perceive is just this limiting amount of gap that will support the non-supportive housing units on these projects. And so I think um, that will be a challenge. Um, and I think a cha uh, obviously I think a lot of counties will also just have to figure out how to get their health care and housing, all the actors all on the same page uh, to do this and take advantage of it. But we're excited and optimistic and glad it's moving. Any questions? I have a question. Yes. So uh, how would we, or, or how are you assessing each county? I mean, because obviously San Francisco County and other counties are a lot more sophisticated in mobilizing there and don't need a lot of TA, but what about the counties who are struggling with homelessness or a rise in it, but don't have that infrastructure yet? How do you, do you have a pulse of really what those counties are and how you're going to reach out to them to make sure, because those are the ones that are going to struggle the most to get it together, not the ones that are already in the industry and know how to go after these funds. Yeah, great question. Uh, don't have the answer. So, uh, well, I mean, first of all, I'll say, to a certain extent, it helps that large counties only go up against other large counties. Right. That'll help a little bit. I think this TA money will help a little bit. Uh, and we're hoping that uh, uh, that over time, at least, you know, given the incentives, given the money that's there, given the notion of doing competitive rounds, that counties will uh, build up their infrastructure in order to seek and pursue these ones. But honestly, this is part of what we need to find out when we do our guideline our writing process and stakeholder engagement process over in the fall. And, uh, so, and then a follow-up to that, so I'll use my own county as an example because that's where my subject matter expertise is, is Contra Costa County. So we don't have affordable housing developers is one big struggle. They're all in San Francisco and Oakland and really don't deviate too much into Cocoa County. Um, two, um, even the home and CDBG funds, we have very, cities have very limited funds. And again, the capacity is just not there. So that would be an example, I'm sure, of many other counties. How would that TA again, how would we build up that capacity? Because one of the criteria is here, the readiness of those developers and team being ready, and they don't really exist like they do in San Francisco or LA. Great question. I don't know the answers. <laughs> Anybody have any thoughts on that one? I say we advocate for this. They look for us to be on the stakeholder advisory committee. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sign up. <laughs> Oh, yes, yeah, so a good point. So there is, there is, the legislation does provide for a pretty broad stakeholder advisory council with representations for mental health, affordable housing, various yes, places yes, of government. Um, my question actually is related to um, my uh, colleague's question, which is sort of on the, the timing of the deployment of the funds. You mentioned something that made me nervous that there was a cutoff time of, or something built into the the, the bond. I'm not sure if that's accurate or not, but it would be especially relative to counties like the one she mentioned and uh, my own. Uh, I'm, I'm in Pomona, so I'm in LA County, but I'm directly adjacent to San Bernardino County where we have the same issues. So I'm very sensitive to that as well because um, we have much, uh, we have big counties, but they're not as sophisticated or ready. Uh, to actually put something like this in action, but they still struggle with homeless in a very big way. Uh, and some would argue uh, it's even more of a tragedy within San Bernardino County that it is a country you know. So on timing on the front end, just to be clear, there's another piece of legislation that we'll need to pass in August with sort of technical bonding details. Uh, we, we think it's a pretty perfunctory piece of legislation. Uh, but it has to happen, it has to get signed. And then there has to be a test case that will be brought by some combination of uh, the State Treasurer's Office, um, and, uh, Department of Finance, um, to the courts to actually uh, make sure that there's no um, uh, conflict with the underlying proposition authority in terms of what's proposed in the legislation. Uh, and uh, I've been told that can happen in 60 to 90 days, but I think we need to understand that that will be um, a little bit of a delay. On the back end, I think uh, there, the legislation as drafted provides for uh, um, 
I think it's at least four rounds of funding to be run on an annual basis, but it also provides some flexibility that it could go on past those four rounds, that it could even, in theory, be uh, multiple rounds in a given year. So I think all of that is intended to kind of help pull counties forward, that rather than just put all the money out tomorrow and whoever's ready gets it, the idea is that if you're not ready in the first round, you can continue to build your capacity and become more competitive over time for those dollars. So hopefully that will, that will work. So one of the things that, that was really valuable in uh, the college that they experience in doing the MHSA housing program was to develop the alternative for small counties to do shared housing uh, where they were not doing you know big development projects but simpler acquisition of rehab and uh, single family home structures to do shared housing. Is that still going to be an option under this new structure? Uh, the legislation does provide for that as an, as an option, uh, but doesn't give any guidance on how it works. So yes, potentially. Ms. Bogner-Tennyson? Um, I, I think what we can do is to allow the board to have further kind of discussion on this. Uh, perhaps at one of the next board members uh, meetings, we could actually agendize it as a discussion item so that we can get more input from board members and then then as, as, as HCD is taking the lead on this, and then the treasurer's office, the Department of Finance, and HCD can hear from you all. And so we could have a more robust discussion on, on, on some of this as more details come out. So we will agendize that for uh, an actual board meeting. We, this was intended just to provide you with like a little brief update. But for that gap period, I wanted to ensure, especially Mr. Hunter, because he was very involved on the MHSA housing and, 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 and prodding staff to make sure that a program continued on. And so what Cal HFA did is about a year ago, when we knew the MHSA housing program uh, that was utilizing the, the original $400 million allocation was rolled out in 2008, that agreement expired in May of this year. So about a year ago, we started having stakeholder meetings with counties about a voluntary MHSA program. And so we rolled out on June 1st our special needs housing program, which we have 14 counties that have committed to participating, and they've committed over $70 million for the 16-17 fiscal year. So we, our, our hope is, is that while we're rolling out and working with counties on that voluntary program, that we can continue to work with counties, perhaps providing technical assistance, getting them ready, as the guidelines are being drafted for the next set of MHSA or No Place Like Home 2.0, that we will be able to share our lessons learned with our sister agency and that that will provide for a nice transition into the new program. And so we do have, MHSA is not going to just stop just because the contract expired. And I, I have to give my shout out to Mr. Hunter because he was the one telling us a year ago what's going to happen, what's going to happen, what's going to happen. And so Calachefe did go to work, and I, I'm pretty proud of the work. And I have to give a shout out to Deborah Starbuck, who was like our loan officer, who went out to the individual counties and to have the counties step up and say they were going to commit at $70 million, all voluntarily, without any legislation. I think that was a pretty big feat to do that. And so we do have some time to be able to work in transition, and I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that. Thank you. And, and I just want to say, my only role was nagging you all. <laughs> it worked. Well done. So the, the last one. Uh, you have one last item. I have one last item. So one of the things, um, in 2011, Chipe had a uh, Bureau of State audit, uh, 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 um, a Bureau of State audits came out with an audit and some recommendations about the board and about wanting to have a trained and knowledgeable board of Cal HFA, and that was during the fiscal crisis when some things had gone on and they were giving us some recommendations to shore up our internal house. One of the things that we historically at Cal HFA hadn't done was to send board members to regular training so that they would know the business of housing finance agencies. And so uh, we have come up with a policy for board training we started in the 14-15 year, actually including in our budget funds to provide that training. And so what I have, and we'll pass out, are 
the policies that we have adopted for board to receive training, how you go about making those requests, the request form for that. And I wanted to announce that the big board training usually occurs at what's called the National Council of State Housing Agency Board Training. And that is that flyer, exactly. Just so that you guys show. That's what this is. Usually they hold this separately every year. Delilah and I went together in 2014, to, um, and that was the first time the National Council of State Housing Agencies that they had re ever had any board representation. We tried to send members last year, but we had some flight issues. But this year they're going to be having the board training in conjunction with the annual conference. And so I think you've attended some of the National Council of State Housing Agencies because CalBed is a member as they're in their single family programs. But so I wanted to provide you with this information and provide you with the draft policy and the training request on how we go about seeking that so that you all would have that information. So, because this is new for us. This isn't something that we have historically done. And so we, we do have, we have to be mindful because most of these occur out of state. And so we're trying to be mindful and thoughtful and, 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 and objective in how we get board members trained and go through that process. So my goal is, is that we would send a small, because we have a very large board, send a small amount of board members to make sure that we have gotten through every board member so that every board member has at least received some NCSHA or NCSHB training related to housing finance agency work during their term. And so I work closely with the chair and we'll work and we'll identify those board members and we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen to make sure that we are meeting those recommendations of the Bureau of State Audit who said you need to have a informed board on housing finance agency matters. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, item number three is approval of the minutes of our last meeting on May 17th. Um, is there a motion to... Uh, so Thank you. Uh, so second. Second. Second for Mr. Gunning. All can uh, call the roll. Ms. Zavala, please. Yes. Mr. Schaefer. Yes. Ms. Gallagher. Yes. Ms. Gunn. Abstain. Mr. Gunning? Yes. Mr. Hunter? Yes. Ms. Johnson Hall? Abstain. Mr. Medcap? Yes. Ms. Ohebu? Abstain. Ms. Sotello? Yes. Mr. Russell? Aye. Ms. Falk? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a request from staff that we move um, item number four, which is a closed session, to the end so that we can do the things with the staff and then they have to leave anyway. So is there any, any objection to that? Okay, we'll move to item number five. Uh, discussion recommendation possible action regarding the adoption of a resolution authorizing the agency to enter into agreement with the federal home on San Francisco. Mr. Sue. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's see if I can. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairwoman and members of the board. Um, let me start off by giving the board member a um, uh, um, a review of where we have been in terms of our credit ratings. Um, last month, we successfully closed a refunding transaction in our single-family flagship indenture called HMRB. Um, and as part of that transaction, the S&P gave us an upgrade from A flat to AA minus. And I thought I would use this occasion to give the board, um, again, sort of a, a refresher of where our ratings are today and how many upgrades we've gotten recently and where, where, there's, where those upgrades have come from. And how do we compare today to the ratings that we once had pre-crisis, if you will? So in 2016, year to date, um, we have gotten four credit rating upgrades. Um, these upgrades are uh, with respect to our three major credits that we track. So they are our general obligation rating, our multifamily rating, and also our single family rating, which is the flagship indenture for HMRB. Um, these upgrades post financial crisis started in 2013. You can see on page two that um, in 2013 we got two upgrades from S&P, 
In 2014, we got one for S&P, one for Moody's. And in 2015, we got one from S&P and one for Moody's. And in 2016, um, in mere uh, six months, I, I would add, we got four upgrades, two from S&P and two from Moody's. So in total, we've gotten 10 upgrades in the last uh, four years or so. So um, things are definitely um, not what they were at some point um, four, five or six years ago. Um, and our ratings today, um, the three major credits that we track, our general obligation rating is now A, A2, and our multifamily rating is A, double A plus and A1 and our single family, single family rating is double A minus and A2. So um, in isolation, these are kind of hard to sort of have a grasp of, of sort of relative um, to where we've been. So if you flip to page three, I'm gonna sort of, this is a chart I've shown before, but I like to sort of compare where we are today to where we were in 2008, with 2008 being sort of the, uh, the point that I'm gonna reference as pre-crisis. So for our, so on page three, th this is the history of our ratings for S&P. So for our single family venture, I kind of sort of bracketed this, bracketed this in uh, yellow because it just got the upgrade. Um, this is now double A minus. And you can see that the double A minus is basically the same as where we were in 2000, 2008. Again, with 2008 being sort of the benchmark for pre-crisis. Um, so HMRB is basically back to where it was. Um, so for S&P, for the multifamily three rating, you can see that our multifamily three rating was last updated in 2014. Um, it has a double A plus rating, which is higher than the double A minus rating by two notches, um, comparing today to 2008 again. And then last but not least is our general obligation rating. You can see that that's now A compared to where we were at double A minus. So we're still two notches below where we were pre-crisis. So we still have a little bit more, more work to do there. Um, and then page four is the history of our ratings with Moody's, again, with respect to these three major credits that we track. Um, in general, Moody's has been a little bit slower and a little bit um, less um, uh, generous, if you will, with their upgrades. Um, so you can see that with respect to HMRB, we're current, our current rating is A2, and we once uh, started in a pre-crisis at double A2. So that's um, a whole three notches lower than where we were in 2008. And for, for, for multifamily three, our current rating is A1, and we were once at double A3, so that's one notch lower than where we were, we were in 2008. And for the GO, um, we're at A2, and we were at double A3, so that's um, two notches lower than where we were in 2008. How much of that disparity between the two is respected to their general disparity between other credits like this, or is it specific to college effect? So does Moody's generally rate, currently rate lower, similar credits of other agencies? Do you have a sense of that? Um, I, I don't think that's the case. No, um, they, they, read, they rate each credit on the standing of its own credit within certain guidelines that they're looking at. Yeah, I, my question is, is that, there, is that their criteria just, is the disparity in ratings based on a disparity of criteria, or are they just? I think they're just harder. Harder. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. The more, S&P is more generous than we Tim. <laughs> Well, Tim, do you want to go first? Maybe you could have a more... Help me <laughs> at an appropriate moment. Um, this is not so much for Eileen's benefit as the rest of the board. Rating agencies will, won't specifically tell you this, but they're rating three things. The health of the economy that the agency is operating in, the health of the agency's operations, as evidenced by its balance sheet and its income statement, and the quality of management. And that third one is the one that um, is very, very difficult to, to get a bead on because it affects the second. The, 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 the strength of the balance sheet, the, 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 the numerical analysis that's performed on the balance sheet and the income statement have a lot to do with what management did to make it look like that. And, um, Moody's, and, and this is what the rating agencies probably will also not want to tell you, is that they have personalities. They have corporate personalities. Um, S&P will, will skew to specific indentures, specific 
legal structures, and it will focus very intently on those things, less so on management and less so on the economy. Uh, Moody's, on the other hand, is very sensitive to the economy that the agency operates in and should be expected in a state like ours, which was battered as badly as it was, I would expect them to be somewhat reluctant to move us up as quickly as the others simply because of that personality. Since we don't rate by Fitch, I won't comment about them, but they, they are still different. The last thing I would observe is that, remember, that the credit rating um, is, um, the, credit, the, 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 the concept of the rating within the three agencies is also subtly different. Um, Moody's, for example, is rating the probability of default and the likelihood of a recovery on a default. So there's something going on in the black box that says, if this bond defaults, what could I reasonably expect to recover um, if uh, we were in a default or workout situation? Standard and Poor's, less so. Standard and Poor's is, this is the probability of default. And, that, and if you think about it, that's logical. That's why they go back to the legal documents and spend so much time focusing on those. So the, uh, sometimes looking at ratings in a, um, uh, in uh, particularly for a complex organization like this is like looking at uh, chicken on trails trying to determine what you know what's going to happen a year from now it uh, uh, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of art and sometimes a little bit of science uh, and there is a black box but perhaps you've got more you want to add I, have, I have a slightly more micro view versus yeah. the macro view um, so I, I I'm not sure if I can um, I haven't spent enough time on the actual methodology um, to compare in our space, like the housing era, so that the housing niche, if you will. Uh, I, I would observe a couple of things, though, is that the analyst makes a huge difference. The analyst makes a huge difference. Um, um, uh, some of the Moody's upgrades um, actually reflects a certain transition in the analyst that we uh, had covering us. Um, so the analyst makes a huge difference. And the other thing is that I feel quite strongly that the methodology, um, as much as they've tried, um, hasn't quite caught up to some of the complex things that people have done in the last eight years or so. And, um, and specifically, I'm talking about some of these uh, VRDOs I've talked to you so much about that requires a, a letter of credit and these swaps. And, and what I mean by that is that though there is some um, on the surface, uh, specific uh, criteria regarding these instruments, um, how the analyst then comes about it and sort of use those methodologies to interpret what's going on um, is actually quite tenuous. The, the connection is fluid from analyst to analyst and, dare I say, from year to year. Um, and so this year, for example, um, on Moody's, um, you can see the greatest difference between our two rating, the, the greatest difference, the greatest spread, if you will, between uh, Moody's view versus S&P's view is in our multifamily three indentures, uh, multifamily three, uh, multifamily indentures, where we have a double A plus from S&P and um, an A1 from um, Moody's. And there, um, it is true that in the multifamily indenture, um, because our sort of aggressive deleveraging, we've gotten rid of a, a lot of variable bonds, but there's still a lot of swaps that are not effectively swapping any VRDOs. We have been managing that, managing that sort of overhang on a balance sheet basis, um, but their view on that is much more critical, a much more sort of um, less forgiving, if you will, than S&P's view. Um, and that, I cannot find that anywhere in their write-up. Um, so, so that's a little bit of um, color I get from on the ground. Um, but the one thing I feel like matters more than these macro differences is that the analyst, gosh, makes a huge difference. <laughs> um, yeah, I would, certainly, I would certainly second that. Also remind the board that um, 
our S&P multifamily rating at the moment is now the same as the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> Go multifamily! <laughs> if we were to succeed, will we get a high rating? I don't know. <laughs> Let's give it a shot. <laughs> So in short, in short, we still have a lot more work to do with Moody's, um, and we're ready for it. And on S&P, we're more focused on our general operation rating. And again, that rating is critical because um, some of our derivative, um, the collateral posting obligations are based on that rating. Um, our collateral posting requirement has come down a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, so it's not as much of a worry, but it's, you know, those are the kind of stuff that we are working on, and hopefully we can get all these ratings um, back up to the pre-crisis level at some point. <clears throat> so agenda item five. So over the past 12 months or so, or perhaps even longer, I've been reporting to the board about our efforts to acquire or expand our working capital um, using different um, ideas of path. And um, in the fiscal 16 and 17 business plan, there's a mandate to expand our working capital via our credit facilities. So today, I'm delighted and I'm ecstatic really to bring to the board um, Resolution 1613, which provides authorization to enter into agreements with Federal Home and Bank of San Francisco for a secure credit facility for financing Fannie Mae and Ginnie Mae mortgage backed securities. This resolution also provides for authorization to perform its, the agency's obligations under the agreement to borrow each advance from Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco, to obtain each commitment from the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco, and to pledge any collateral to the Federal Home Bank of San Francisco for this transaction. Um, I'm being a little bit more literal in this presentation because there are certain aspects of the agreement that requires um, specific things to be said in the minutes of the board. Um, it's not usually how I present, but there are, there are certain things that they want us to be actually in the minutes of the board and said and approved by the board. Um, it's worth noting that a couple of things. This credit facility is only for the moment for single family mortgage-backed securities. Um, the documents that we're executing, um, uh, let, let, me, let me come back to that in a second, but for the moment, the facility is only for single-family mortgage-backed securities. Oops. The, this is an extremely cost-effective credit facility that will allow the agency to provide, um, uh, it, will, it will give us more flexibility in terms of how we manage our liquidity and will expand our lending capacity. And just to give the uh, board uh, some color on the pricing, um, the live pricing I got at midday last Friday, July 8, 2016, um, the, the facility depends on the tenor of the facility. So for a six month tenor is 55 basis points. For, again, this is, um, to, to, it's important to note that these are pricings as of midday last Friday. Uh, for a nine-month tenor is 65 basis points, and for a 12-month tenor is 73 basis points. A um, couple of good things about this facility. One is that there's no unused fee. Oftentimes when we get a credit facility from a bank, there's a, sort of like a commitment fee. Even though you don't use it, there's a fee to be charged. Um, for pricing purposes, um, CalHFA is not a full member of the bank. We are referred to as a housing associate. But for pricing purposes, we are getting the pricing that their full members are getting, which is fantastic. And but um, not no but. And for collateral posting purposes, we're being treated um, in the category in the collateral in, in their collateral guide under the insurance companies with high credit quality ratings and non-depository CDFIs. So there's a category ahead of us, which is the highest credit quality. Um, we're not there, but that's part of the reason why I gave the board sort of that slightly longer presentation on where our credit is. Maybe one day we'll get there, but right now we're being treated as the high credit quality ratings and not the highest credit quality ratings. Um, so I, from my vantage point, those are extremely you know, great things that we're being treated, that we're not a, 
members of the bank actually have a certain, is a co-op, actually certain ownership of the bank, and we're being treated um, like a full member in terms of pricing, and we fall within a certain category in terms of collateral posting. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the business plan does include a mandate to expand our working capital via credit facilities, and this is um, one of the prime things that we're working on at the time when we put that into our business plan. Uh, we fully expect to draw from the credit facility later this year, and we would be, and we will be, the first housing associate, a first non-bank to borrow from the Federal Home and Bank of San Francisco. In the history of the bank, which is 120 years, first one. He's being very modest. <laughs> <laughs> so my understanding is that um, uh, HECLA at some point got approved to borrow, but they never borrowed. Um, so we are the second to be approved as a housing associate, and when we draw, we'll be the first to draw. Jim, are you aware if any insurance companies are there have been accepted? I know they were looking at it for a while. In that higher level, no insurance companies, to oh. your knowledge? You mean insurance companies that qualify for the higher, the yes, highest? are participate with the bank. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I know the answer to that. They'd approached us a few years ago about how to put that in statute. Uh -huh. When you said insurance, I just wonder. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. But I, I think that from my vantage point, um, in terms of pricing, it's fantastic. And I think in terms of collateral posting, um, it's manageable. It's something that we're working on right now. And um, I think that there's room for us to move into a more uh, generous collateral posting requirement, and we'll, we'll continue to work on that as our credits improve. Mr. Metcalf? Yeah, can you explain to me if there is a, a, an option for a, multi, like a multi-family line of credit? Have you begun conversations there? Or is this on the horizon? What, what's your plan? Funny ask. Um, so that was the first thing Tia asked me when I, um, <laughs> <laughs> she was like, well, how about multi-family? Um, the documents that we're executing with them um, actually has the um, capability or availability to post a, a, a lot of different kinds of collateral. So it does contemplate, let's say, uh, commercial loans even, and it does contemplate multifamily loans, um, uh, insured or uninsured. Um, so we're executing a set of documents that is quite wide open. But in terms of credit approval inside the bank, we currently only have single-family mortgage-backed security. Um, the relationship person, as he says it, my, my guide inside the bank, his name is Tom Wilson, he said that we can, we can look at that, um, let's say, in Q1 of next year. Um, for, and so specifically, the thing that we were talking about is that will he be willing to take uh, these risk share loans that we make um, as collateral? And I briefly explained to him what the program was. And he said, yeah, we can, we can certainly look at that. I think that the thought here is that let's get this transaction consummated, let's do a little bit of business, everybody will feel good, and then we can do more business. Um, and I think that, oh, I failed to mention, and I'm very sorry about this, I failed to mention that this line is for $100 million. It's a revolving $100 million um, line. And we've talked about including multifamily loans, we talked about increasing that line. I think that, um, I've always said this sort of somewhat in just that there's, there's nothing more like doing more business when you're doing some business. You know, we'll, you know, we'll do a little bit of business and then when everybody knows that, gets to know each other a little bit, we know the process and know that, that we can be a good business partner, um, we can do more things over time. Any other questions, Mr. Shaver? A couple of observations that this is helpful for content kind of pricing that the homeowner uh, has offered the HFA uh, is competitive with what the state's pool money account is earning as we sit next week. We're just over 55 basis points and that's 60, close to 60 percent of the U.S. Treasuries has an average life of around 180 days last time I looked. Um, so that all by itself, even though we've had a lot of compression of credit spreads, is really, really significant. And then I guess the second thing I would uh, offer to the to the board, as a person who's done this all my life, is uh, an enthusiastic, wildly enthusiastic congratulations to the to the staff for securing this. This was a lot harder than it looks. This is a very very nice. 
credit facility. I'm, I'm, I'm deeply impressed, and I think we should all give everybody a big round on that one. <laughs> um, I didn't bring a jacket so I can dance for you. Um, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> that's right. That's okay. Um, yes, this is. I think this is fantastic. I think that there's a lot of a lot of uh, possibilities of what other things we can do. Um, like, for example, um, we got a specific kind of uh, facility from them, which they refer to as a secure credit facility. But when I get sort of a pricing sheet, there's all sorts of other stuff that they offer to the full banks that we can contemplate one day. Um, not just sort of inside the walls of this credit facility that we can post collateral um, that could be multifamily and that could be insured and uninsured. There's actually other services that can provide to the full members. Um, obviously, they haven't guaranteed that we can avail ourselves to them, but I really feel that the, the partnership has a lot of room to grow. Any other questions? Um, anyone else? I, I do have one more page. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, yeah, so as I was mentioned earlier, there is, there, is, there is an effort on my part today to be a little bit more literal, um, in part because of our um, response to some of the things that they require, to do things a little bit more cautiously. So, uh, so out of abundance of caution, I'd like to enumerate some of, the, some of the key and known documents that we're going to execute to consummate this transaction. Uh, we'll execute the settlement transaction account agreement. Um, the safekeeping agreement, the advances and security agreement, the certificate of designated persons, wire transfer services, and resolution and authorization housing associate transactions. So those are some of the key known documents that we have to execute. And again, it's um, it, it was it, this is in reaction to something they have in uh, one of the documents that they wanted some of these things to be reflected in the minutes of the or authorization. So that that's. Ms. Johnson Hall, did you have a question? I did. Uh, I also want to say congratulations to the staff. This is big. I actually worked with uh, several federal home loan banks, and my first mm -hmm. thought was, I've never seen this done. Uh, so it was nice to, to see and, and have Tia acknowledge this is a big deal. I've never seen Congratulations. Uh, the two questions that I had were, uh, Tim, you spoke about it. What was the unused fee? I didn't see that in the agreement, and I don't know if we need to have that actually in the agreement, uh, or if it's there, I just didn't see it, and I looked for it. Uh, and then, um, do we need to include the $100 million in the resolution, or not? I, I would think that that's a term that they might want to have as the actual dollar amount that you were allowed. Um, so, we didn't include the $100 million in part because um, we thought that, as, as I mentioned, that uh, the, the conversation that, that Tom Wilson and I have had is that he feels that there's room for that $100 million to increase so that um, if we can do that as the business grows, um, it, would be, it could be uh, more flexible than uh, coming back to the board. But, but that's open to the board's comment. Um, so the other thing is that there are certain things in the agreement, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you caught that, Tina. There are certain things in the agreement <coughs> that are a little bit different than the, uh, the things that I normally see from a private bank. Um, and I talked to Tom Wilson about this, and his response is that some of the things that are in there are, are to safeguard the bank's position, but they have never been evoked. So for example, the, the, your example is a good one, that sort of that unused fee. Uh, there's actually a section in there that actually kind of implies that there's an unused fee. But he said that there's no unused fee to me, and, and there's, they never charge an unused fee. And there's also another section that implies that though this whole facility um, is meant to be a way for us to um, borrow from them, um, I think this is sort of towards the back, it actually suggests that this is actually not a commitment for them to lend to us. 
Um, and I say, well, what, why, why do you have that? That seems odd. This, is, this, what is this but a commitment? Um, and he said that well, it's because post 9/11, they had certain banks that had kind of perhaps wanted to tap the bank, and then the bank felt that they. Um, I don't know how that actually re resolved itself, but they, they felt that should something like that happen again, they wanted to have an out. So they had this language that suggests that this is not a commitment when this is really a credit facility. So there are things like that in which, um, how should I say that? Again, it's not how I typically see a private letter of credit, um, but it is, it is different. Um, but um, I. I, I accept his word when he says that his full members all accept these documents as they are. Do they charge their full members an unused fee? So they do, So it's in their documents that they're going to charge it. They don't say what it is, but then they don't charge it. That's correct. Does that answer your question, Tina? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that's helpful. That was, that's good to know. Yeah, so there are some things in there that are different. Yeah, I, I mean, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest. Um, yeah, I, I, I repeat, repeatedly ask him that are these the documents that your full banks get? And um, he said um, they did have to change it a little bit because we're a housing associate. But it's my understanding that these are these their standard provisions that their uh, full member banks get. Oh, Mr. Gunn. So, so that just makes me ask the question. I don't think there's any risk associated with this, but this seems like a plain vanilla thing. Outside of them saying no if there's another 9-11, I don't see any risk to the agency behind this. Um, I think that uh, for now, um, be, it being $100 million, um, no. But if the day comes in which this thing grows to, let's say, half a billion, and we, we could be happy about that. Yeah. And then we have all sorts of stuff on there, including multifamily loans, and somehow some catastrophe after God happens. Um, there, there could be a bigger issue, but today I don't foresee that. Well, in that regard, the, the terms, you mentioned the different tenors that you can borrow on. What, what's the term out if there were, you know, can you extend? Is it? Yeah. What happens? So you could extend. Um, so if you take down a six-month um, tenor um, uh, credit facility, um, when the time comes, you could extend. Um, and there's um, there's there in the agreement. I think there's um, even a, a suggestion that you could pay earlier. And when if you do pay earlier, um, they do have um, certain fees, terminate early termination fees. So you could extend. Um, the one other feature I didn't, uh, I forgot to mention is that the agreement itself uh, doesn't actually have a maturity date or a term. It's it's kind of how they do business with their normal members too. That it's a facility, and it's basically good, and they're willing to uh, do business uh, until they're not willing to do, bi to, to do business, um, and it really doesn't have a term. So as long as we stay in the good graces. Um, we can do this um, uh, forever. Mr. Shepard? I, I, I have a question about um, uh, that there are three signatories authorized in the agreement. Are you satisfied that you have appropriate internal controls to make sure that, that what's behind those three signatories protects the agency from a really employee, of course I'm looking at all three of the employees mm -hmm. and I don't expect anybody's a rogue, but uh, just to make sure of that, do we do you have adequate internal controls to make sure that, that uh, uh, there's a system of checks and balances inside the organization to protect against an inappropriate role? Yes, and I think for the moment, since this is a secure line too, that would itself would act as a safeguard. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Um, now, one of the things that Ms. Johnson Hall had asked was about the amount. And so the amount is not stated in the resolution. Our intention is that it be $100 million. Should we ever exceed or want to exceed $100 million? That is information that I would bring back to the board. 
but I because I asked the exact same question, should it be in the resolution? And staff and after having checked with the Federal Home Loan Bank, they said that they wanted to have the flexibility, but I want to ensure that I we want to be very open and transparent with our board and that should we want or have a plan to exceed that, that I would bring that information back to the board. Okay. Can we include in the resolution a requirement that you would come back to the board to report that you would just exceed that? I right. would be more comfortable. That would be that. just the opposite of what they said they wanted in the resolution because uh -huh. they said they wanted the flexibility. But so now, I'm not talking that you can't exceed it, but that if you are exceeding it or going to increase it, that you report it to the board. Okay, Victor. Well, or could we do it as a separate resolution? We we could do that, but but candidly, I think that's the direction that that board is giving staff. It's in the minutes. It's reflected, and we'll abide by that without it being included in the resolution. Okay. And I can make that commitment that we would come back to the board. I, Mr. Shepard. I, I I think that is important. I. I understand why it looks like this. This is the closest thing you could find to this in a commercial banking sector would be what's called a guidance line, which doesn't commit the bank to a specific amount, doesn't even commit them to lend. Mm -hmm. But but there's it's 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 a paper thin margin from full unequivocal bulletproof commitment to lend and uh, and a guidance line. And as a you know, career banker, I would say that one of the things I'm interested in, frankly, is that sometimes my best maneuver, if you get in trouble, is to actually lend you more money so I can control you a little better. And that's that's the that's the way it works. You know, borrow a million from the bank, the bank owns you. Borrow a billion from the bank, you own the bank. So, um, you know, so I would be reluctant to put something in the resolution, but I share the view that I think it is appropriate that the board discuss with you some understanding about limitations on the on the utilization of the line. So Victor, how is a directive from the board to be enough and it be reflected in the minutes in my commitment or do we need a separate resolution? Or how, how could we best meet what the bank's needs are for flexibility and Tim's desire for flexibility sure. and the board's desire to stay informed? I, I, think it's, I think the direction that the board is given is very clear. And you as the executive director are uh, supervised by the board and you, you adhere to their direction and that direction has been given. It's very clear. And so it's incumbent upon you as the EDA to comply with that. Um, it's, it's clear in the minutes. It candidly need not be reflected in a resolution. Okay. Well, I commit to the board. <laughs> Shall we okay, want to owe be over a hundred million that we will be returning to you? All right. May I hear a motion to adopt resolution number sixteen? So moved. Thank you. A second. Second. Mr. Redcap, call the roll, please. <laughs> Ms. Avila, please? Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Ms. Gallagher? Yes. Ms. Gunn? Yes. Mr. Gunning? Yes. Mr. Hunter? Yes. Ms. Johnson Hall? Yes. Mr. Metcalf? Yes. Ms. Ohebu? Yes. Ms. Sotello? Yes. Mr. Russell? Aye. Ms. Falk? Yes. Resolution 1613 is approved. Okay, we'll move on to um, item number six of the reports. So we generally do not go through them um, unless there are questions from the board. So does anyone have any questions? Okay. Uh, should we do the public testimony next? Uh, I prefer we go into closed session now. Yeah, before we go into closed session. Yes. So is there, I don't see anybody from the public, but is there anyone <laughs> who wants to uh, bring the matter to the board's attention? 
Hearing none. So we will now move to item four, which is closed session to discuss the motivation and we ask those of who are appropriate to leave to please do so. And thank you all very much for what you've done. Do we keep taking No. Are we live? I didn't talk to them. No, we're not live. I don't mind something else. It'll be blank.
good. So we're back in open session, and uh, any, comments? Any, any comments? Nothing to report out of closed, so. Okay. Uh, we are, one issue that had come up was technology and making the board more technologically savvy and stop go get away from paper and go electronically. And we have them provided that information, and Pam and Victor are continuing to work on looking at options. Is that correct? Any updates? Uh, no, no updates. We were right. Kathy and I, and Pam and I are uh, working on it. Okay. And we were going to survey the board. I, I think. What? I Kathy, we you moved there. I didn't get a board packet, so I was prepared. For that. <laughs> oh. Okay. You you didn't get a board packet. I did not get a board packet. So did you download it all on your iPad? Uh, yeah. Or did I? I well, I, I apologize. I I'll look into that to understand why that's the case. It, you should have all received your packages. I did. Everyone's got a red folder. I didn't receive one either. I'm sorry? I didn't receive either. Okay. I didn't receive one either. Okay. But I had it out We will be moving forward with all deliberate speed <laughs> <laughs> to move to the 21st century. <laughs> How about that? We will. Okay. So we're adjourned? Based on that, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.